Let us pray. Almighty God, graciously behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and delivered into the hands of sinful men to suffer death upon the cross for the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for Good Friday is from Isaiah chapters 52 and 53. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up, and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so far beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by him, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked, and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquity. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many, and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. 
Merciful and everlasting God, you did not spare your only Son, but delivered him up for us all to bear our sins on the cross. Grant that our hearts may be so fixed with steadfast faith in him that we fear not the power of sin, death, and the devil for the same of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you will that your Son should bear for us the pains of the cross, and so remove from us the power of the adversary. Help us so to remember and give thanks for our Lord's passion, that we may receive forgiveness of sin and redemption from everlasting death through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Tigre Valley, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, but Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a great band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that had happened to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. 
Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you see? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having the sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door, and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with a hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? And it's then sent him bound to Caiaphas the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest. A relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed.
Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered him, I am Jew. Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. <laughs> See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man! And the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, we have the law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, Will you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. 
Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, and in their man, the Bath. Now, it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold, your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, The King of the Jews, but rather, This man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. And the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. Behold, your mother. 
And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, To fulfill the scripture, I thirst. John, full of sour wine, stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. Jesus had received the sour wine and said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. This evening's tone is always so much more somber. I mean, we are talking about death. 
So it takes on the, the semblance of a funeral service. That is what Good Friday is. We get all the gory details concerning the, the trial and the execution of Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, was predicted through the prophet Isaiah, how brutally Jesus would be killed, giving similar details to his death 700 years before it happened. And David was also shown a glimpse of the suffering of the Christ about a thousand years before it happened, and he broke down what he saw through the Holy Spirit in Psalm 22, the psalm we used last evening in the stripping of the altar. In a huge travesty of justice, an innocent man is condemned and a guilty man is set free. Jesus, the innocent one, declared so by Pilate, by Herod, by Pilate's wife, he is condemned and executed by crucifixion. The normal judicial processes are abandoned so that Jesus would be executed quickly so that no one could break him free from prison or find evidence to exonerate him. He's condemned and then he's immediately executed. That's what normally gets done for someone who is a notorious criminal. Don't give him any chance to get free. Just be rid of this evil menace. That's how the Jews view Jesus. So that at his death, they're celebrating being rid of their enemy. So now they can go back to business as usual. <coughs> this innocent man takes the place of a guilty man. Pilate, in his usual custom, had released a prisoner of the people's choosing during the Passover. What a choice they had this year. Jesus or Barabbas, a murderer and an insurrectionist, or one who's called the King of the Jews, who was well known for performing healing miracles, even raising the dead back to life. The chief priest urged the people to ask for Barabbas. And that's what they get. And Jesus takes Barabbas' place on the cross, executed for being the people's king. Remember, they wanted to make him their bread king. And they fed over 5,000 with just five loaves and two fish. Before we get too depressed about how much injustice is being carried out against Jesus, let's remember that this is why he came to earth in the first place. This is what David, Isaiah, and the other prophets have predicted through the Holy Spirit because this is what God had planned from the beginning. In order for the guilty to be saved, the innocent must take his place. One who is perfectly sinless will give his life for the completely guilty. Jesus is our Savior, taking our place in sin and death, and in exchange, giving us the freedom that he earned with his perfect life. Jesus, the only begotten Son of God the Father, obediently fulfilled his Father's will. He lived the perfect life according to all God's commandments. And he took the place of us disobedient sons and daughters, accepting our punishment as his own. His beatings were the blows that we Deserved for our sins and disobedience. The slander he heard in his ears is what we deserve when our wicked tongues spew against others. His pain was what we deserve for abusing others, thinking that others are sinners and proclaiming ourselves righteous in our own sight. All this Christ did for those who believe in him in order that the Heavenly Father might once again claim those who are lost in sin as found, found by His grace, and those who were dead in sin to be made alive again in Christ. 
Not only did Jesus take the place of Barabbas, but more importantly, he took our place in life and death. The innocent in the place of the guilty. He lived the perfect life we do not and died the death we deserve. This great exchange took Jesus to death in order that you might have life. Even on this most somber of days, the day that we call Good Friday, we have some joy. But it's really, it's like the final day of creation. We should call this day Very Good Friday. Our sins are finished. And we are not. We have a guarantee of heaven, not because of our works, but because of Jesus' death for us on the cross that paid all our debt. The Son of the Father takes our place so that we can have a place in heaven. Our sins are washed away by the blood of the Lamb. The covenant we have broken and been unable to fulfill has been fulfilled in Christ. It is finished. Death claims Christ momentarily so that eternal life might be bestowed upon everyone who believes in Christ. Yes, Good Friday becomes for us very Good Friday. It's a long fulfillment of God's promises. They have now come we are now sure of our forgiveness and eternal life. The death of Christ means we have life. He's taken away death for us. He's conquered it so that we do not fear it, but welcome it. We can be ready to leave this world of sin and death and enter eternal life with joy and thanksgiving. Disciples and the women left the cross and the tomb of Jesus bewildered and confused. Was Jesus the Christ? They weren't sure. But on the third day, they did know for certain. The words of the angels and Jesus himself pointed them to the peace of God, that they now had forgiveness for all their sins. This is what Jesus assures the disciples that they have from him, that they can give to one another forgiveness. Just like the brothers of Joseph feared for their lives after the death of their father, those without faith fear death and the judgment that comes with their sinful life. But just as Joseph assured his brothers of his forgiveness, Jesus rose to assure the disciples and us that we also have forgiveness for all our sins from him. Jesus has taken your place, carried your sin into death, in order that you might pass through the gate of death into eternal life. Cast every burden of your sin at the foot of the cross and come back on Easter to receive the fruits of the cross, the body and blood of Christ that were given and shed for the forgiveness of all your sins. Just as surely as all these events have taken place for your benefit, you can trust the words of Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiven sin, born, your sins that cause the death of Jesus, but know that your sins are forgiven. And just as Christ rose from the dead, so will you. And you will live eternally in paradise with him. Well, everything will again be very good forever. Because the innocent has died for the guilty. Amen.
us pray for the whole Christian church, that our Lord God would defend her against all the assaults and temptations of the adversary, and keep her perpetually on the true foundation, Jesus Christ. Almighty and everlasting God, since you have revealed your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ, and in the word of his truth, keep, we ask you, in safety the works of your mercy, so that your church, spread throughout all the nations, may be defended against the adversary, and may serve you in true faith, and persevere in the confession of your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all the ministers of the word, for all vocations in the church, and for all the people of God. Almighty, everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is governed and sanctified, receive the supplications and prayers which we offer before you, for all of your servants in your holy church, that every member of the same may truly serve you according to your calling. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our catechumens, that our Lord God would open their hearts and the door of his mercy, that having received the remission of all their sins by the washing of regeneration, they may be mindful of their baptism, and evermore be found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Mighty God and Father, because you always bring growth to your church, Increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that rejoicing in their new birth by the water of holy baptism, they may forever continue in the family of those who you adopt as your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Merciful Father in heaven, because you hold in your hand all the mind of man, and because you have ordained for the punishment of evil doers and for the praise of those who do well, all the powers that exist in all the nations of the world, we humbly pray you graciously to regard your service, especially our president, the Congress of the United States, our government, and all who make, administer, and judge our laws. That all who receive the sword as your ministers may bear it according to your word. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray, our Lord God Almighty, that you would deliver the world from all error, take away all disease, ward off famine, and set free those in bondage, and grant health to the sick, and a safe journey to all who travel. Almighty and everlasting God. The consolation of the sorrowful and the strength of the weak. May the prayers of those who, in any tribulation or distress, cry to you graciously come before you, so that in all of their necessities they may rejoice in your manifold help and comfort. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who are outside the church, that our Lord God will be pleased to deliver them from their error. Call them to faith in the true and living God and in his only Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and gather them into his family in the church. Almighty and everlasting God, because you seek not the death but the life of all, hear our prayers for all who have no right knowledge of you. Free them from your error, and for the glory of your name, bring them into the fellowship of your holy church. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for peace, that we may come to the knowledge of God's holy word and walk before him as is fitting for Christians. Almighty and everlasting God, King of glory and Lord of heaven and earth, by whose spirit all things are governed, and by whose providence all things are ordered, the God of peace and the author of all concord, <laughs> grants us, we implore you, your heavenly peace and concord, that we may serve you in true fear, for the praise and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our enemies, that God would remember them in mercy and graciously grant them such things as are needful for them 
and profitable for their salvation. O Almighty Everlasting God, through your only Son, our blessed Lord, you have commanded us to love our enemies, to do good to those who hate us, and to pray for those who persecute us. We therefore earnestly implore you that by your gracious visitation, all our enemies may be led to true repentance, and may have the same love and be of one accord and one mind and heart with us and with your whole Christian church. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the fruits of the earth, that God would send down his blessing upon them and graciously dispose our hearts to enjoy them according to his own good will. O Lord, Father Almighty, by your word you created and you continue to bless and uphold all things. We pray you so to reveal to us your word, our Lord Jesus Christ, that through his dwelling in our hearts we may, by your grace, be made ready to receive your blessing of the, all the fruits of the earth and whatsoever pertains to our bodily need. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Finally, let us pray for all things for which our Lord would have us ask, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Behold, the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the world. O God, let us worship you. Behold, the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the world. O God, let us worship you. Behold, the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the world. O God, let us worship you. Thus says the Lord, What have I done to you, O my people, and wherein have I offended you? Answer me. For I have raised you up out of the prison house of sin and death. You have delivered up your Redeemer to be scourged. For I have redeemed you from the house of bondage, and you have nailed your Savior to the cross. O my people, Holy, Lord God, holy and mighty God, holy and most merciful Redeemer, God eternal. Leave us not to bitter death. O Lord, have mercy. Persecute me, for I 
have fed you with my word and refreshed you with living water. And you have given me gall and vinegar to drink. Oh, my people. Oh, Lord God, holy and mighty God, holy and most merciful Redeemer, God eternal. Allow us not to lose hope in the face of death and hell. O Lord, have mercy. Now 
and forever.